Do you hear that? It's something quite extraordinary. If you pay attention and listen closely, you'll hear the stories of senior executives transforming brands and the experiences of real people in their natural habitat with those very same brands. Follow your host, Dennis Wakabayashi, as he pulls out his microphone to capture authentic reactions from the people he meets as he travels around the world. These are unrehearsed, unsponsored, and real conversations about CX that you won't find anywhere else. This is CX in the Wild. Hello. Um, all right, Andrew. We were in. We were on a panel together at uh, Reuters uh, Customer Service and Experience 2022. We had dinner together where I just talked your ear off, and it was. I, I left that thinking that guy hates me. I literally just no, glad no. the whole time. But you were, you, you were engaging in some philosophical ways and technological and professional ways that I don't often get. So it made me a little bit, and I'm easily excitable, and I'm I'm a blabbermouth. So um, I'm glad to have you on my little small unknown podcast called CX in the Wild. It hasn't even released yet, but I'm certain. Just don't get your hopes up. There'll be like four people who listen to this, <laughs> which is also good for us because we can talk about whatever we want. But what's great about this is this is a chance for you to talk to me and I can record it so that others can get a taste of this philosophical business digital intrigue that I had. So with that, I just thank you again for sitting here to talk to me. Thank you, Dennis. Um, let's start out with who you are, and I don't want to know about your job. Tell me about who you are as a person who's ended up leading one of the bigger brand CX UX initiatives in, in the, the country or the world. Since it's a podcast in the wild, let's start with the fact I wander. My career, my background is in design, that's probably the only consistent thread. Well, there may be others, but it's probably design. It's probably visualizing things that people want, desire, or don't know they want or desire yet. But I'm a learner. I'm curious, which is good for me. At Block, those are two of our biggest behaviors. I was heavily influenced at a point in my um, learning where I made a transition from architecture to something other in design. It could have been vision, it could have been identities. It was planning experiences for Coca-Cola or for a biennial in Denver. I was influenced by Bruce Mao and he built a studio around multidisciplinary designers. I think like I, house. There you go. I fit in then that, in that crowd uh, because I am driven by what it could be. Most of us underestimate the future. That's we great. Yeah. overestimate the past, what is known. So if you're talking to a person and you don't want to talk about my career. Oh, well, let's just, before we get into yeah, that, yeah, I mean, yeah. you said so much right okay. there. Those are pretty profound statements. It does talk, it does, you know, when I hear you say it, we overestimate the past, we underestimate the future, what I really hear is somebody who is, aware in the present and that that maybe is one of the reasons i'm drawn to you you do have visibility forward and back but you're you seem very um tangibly present um can you can you just unpack uh your tangible presentness go no <laughs> as fast as i can yeah get, but i but, haven't always been present my in my lifetime we have accelerated to the future, and most of the things around us. In the last four years, maybe with kids, maybe being inside of a Sonos, a technology company, thinking of the future, but also designing experiences that were present but absent, like learning how to do that was very difficult. Now with my teams and the way I want to influence the organization, I, I care and I focus and I prepare and I train a lot on be here now be in the moment, be overdue. And so I've worked hard on myself 
to be right here, Dennis, talking together, your mind wanders. And then you have to quickly snap, bring it back. It also requires deep thinking. There's a great book, Fast and Slow Thinking. It was Michael Lewis's book about two behavioral scientists. I read it. Uh, their work is, is, is a better read, um, but it's dense. I think our natural automatic thinking propelled by the acceleration in culture is making slow thinking, focused and present thinking very hard. And in creativity, the, the field that maybe I'm most natural in, you have to be present and maybe distracted all at the same time. But you can't be always in the future. You can't always be looking at the past. And I want my teams, I want the organizations that I be a part of, I want our customers to slow down, be present, enjoy what you're doing. There's a story I read yesterday to date our conversation. Customer threw a soda at a retail associate, upset, right? There's very little patience. There's very little presentness in that interaction. Someone mentioned yesterday patience, grace, dignity. COVID in the last one and a half years has, has really affected all that. I don't know if it's one and a half years. I think we have replaced busyness and activity with being very present with the people and the things we enjoy the most, thinking that that was what we should be doing. And so that's maybe why I try to focus making every interaction with Andrew, maybe feel focused, maybe feeling present. And then hopefully that, that, that gets into my work that gets into my team's culture. That, that is what my team's culture is. So I, that's it. Let, let's talk about that. I, there was a famous quote and now on the internet, you can't ever cite the quote because you have no idea in which quote was, mm -hmm. but there, the quote was, is how you do anything is how you'll do everything. And I, I would, Venture guess that your presentness and your style is part of how your customers experience mm. the brands that you work for. But it's not enough to be you and nope. get that done at a corporation. I, when we at dinner you talked about some of these um, habits that you have with your people that involve learning and exposure to culture of design. Can you? Share with me and I'll tell you, I hear about that and I've been part of these initiatives and they don't last very long. They, um, they start out with good intentions, but they fizzle. And so when I first heard you say that, I was like, yes, of course, that's the move, but it doesn't really work very long, does it? But I didn't want to be offensive. <laughs> but what I loved about our conversation is as you talked about your work, your work has stood a little bit of a test of time. It was this six week run, or it wasn't like a quarter and then people, your business decided, let's not pay attention to that anymore. You've done it for a while. How long have you been, tell me, tell, tell us about your cultural learning practice that you've introduced at your I, company. I dig that, the, the cultural learning term. I was in, I, I worked with Bruce Mao in the studio for seven years. Some of what we were, I was learning at that time was how to build a culture of creativity. And so as I've moved into different parts, when I got to Block, as, I built, as we were building the center of excellence around UX, IX, content design, customer experience, I realized we had to build a culture that could do that. So that, that starts with behaviors. You said initiatives. Initiatives are great. I think behaviors are far more indicative of something succeeding and be sustaining. So there's a few that we're doing. Some of them I'm doing, some of them the team is doing. Every two weeks, we invite external guests, great thinkers, new thinkers, people that have done it, people that are still doing it, to our team. It's Monday, it's 3 to 4 p.m. Central, and it's intentionally at that time, at that day, to inspire our teams for the rest of the week. It's like rocket fuel on the first day. Everybody has the case of the Mondays. I tell my team, let's not believe that. We have a good case of the Mondays. We're getting our week going. I make sure that every other week I send my thoughts, my inspirations to the team. They're things I find in the world. They're things I find on the internet. It's mixed with thanks, kudos, affirmation, confirmation of individual team members or recognizing things that they did. I think the science says you need to recognize positively reinforce three to four times as much to overcome a negative natural bias we all have.
So that's what we're trying to do there. And you also mentioned listening to the customer. So we are challenging our team to spend eight hours a month. They could spend more with customers. That could be in our innovation labs and research. It could be watching videos of research happening. It could be in the daily and decibel. I challenge myself. That's not my team. I'm listening to that many hours or watching or hearing or talking to customers. And then we make sure those are readily available for the org. So this email, this creative conversation, it's not just for design. It's not just for the creative thinkers. IT, software engineering, product, marketing, they're invited to them all. They get the same note. I'm always interested to hear someone into our operations come back and say, wow, your session with Danny on augmented intelligence, I could totally apply that to how we're doing our fulfillment network. I'm like, that's, that's great because now we're not only keeping that work inside of our team, we're influencing how the org sees us because we're building a center of excellence. So we have to kind of do a little bit of PR and we're also making them think the same way, right? We're helping ourselves think in a diverse way. So those are just a few of the behaviors we're doing. And next year, I'm challenging myself to do 20 interviews instead of just people coming in. So I'm learning right now in our conversation how to do a great how to do a great interview. Just listen, I guess. <laughs> not talk. So like our dinner where I was talking the whole time, not a great interview. <laughs> okay, okay, do it. When you told the story about what you're doing, <clears throat> the thing that still strikes me is I've heard that story before, Andrew. I work in ad agencies. Everybody has one of these things, yeah. but they don't last very long. How long has your, your thing been going on? Two years. Yeah. That's a long time. I don't know if you have the market research that I do, <laughs> I don't. but at the very best one year, but you're in mm -hmm. terms of cultural relevancy metrics mm -hmm. within a brand, you have to be the goat in my opinion. Mm. It's, it's unheard of. The, and I imagine your brand is so impacted in ways they don't even know yet. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that it's underneath. It becomes a subconscious where a lot of creative thinking happens. Um, Michael Pollan recently wrote a book about psychedelics. And I'm not suggesting that that's the way. But there's so much happening in your subconscious. You kind of just have to create space and allow it to be present to get to that. But... Another way maybe the reason they've lasted for two years is uh, I'm very focused on goals. I set a goal for myself. These are part of the, my goals every year for my, the way I talk to my VP, the way I talk to my team. These are our team goals. We have to have 25 conversations a year. I'm incentivizing myself to look deeply into adjacent spaces, into articles and podcasts and videos so that I can send my email. I'm learning this. This is about me learning and I'm sharing it. But in order for that behavior to stick, I intentionally make it a goal. And also something I learned, I put it next to a moment of positive impact in my day. No one wants to do a workout or save money when you put it next to negative moments of your day. So with a great cup of coffee, I look at stuff, I find things, and I put it into my drafts. I give myself two weeks to assemble this, this note. And I do it intentionally at that time of the day. Another cultural practice. Four o'clock every other day, it's recognition minute. We have these things called block stars. I'm allowed to give associates who do exceptional things or everyday things, block stars. So for 15 minutes, four o'clock, it's on my calendar. Everybody at the company knows what I'm doing for those 15 minutes. I'm writing down kudos, affirmations, and they're not generic. Great job. Those might help. They're very specific. One of my team members. They're present. Yeah, one of my team members, Jason, did a great presentation on Tiger team development efforts for our Spruce UI toolkit, in which the presentation failed halfway through, and he made it through with grace and still conveyed what he needed to. That was more or less what I wrote for him. And that's the intentionality. Someone on, on stage spoke about actionable feedback. When I was at Sonos, we had a purpose of can visit complete for our website e-commerce experience. They generally ask about four questions. There's nothing actionable in that. So what we started to do was build tiers of questions. So if you said your purpose of your visit was to research, we built four other steps for that customer to give us very detailed feedback so that we knew 
it was actually our product and specs tab that was underperforming. The customer told us that, but you wouldn't know that if they just said, I came here to do research. You'd have to read thousands of comments, which AI is getting good at doing. We just kind of shortcut that and gave everybody a button. Specificity is another cultural value of our team. And that's how we can deliver great performance feedbacks, how we can deliver great feedback to the customer and do great design work. So a couple of things yep. I wanted you to finish that going backwards. When you talk about specificity, mm -hmm. spec Specific. Look at that one. <laughs> when you talk about this being specific, intentional, mm -hmm. intentionally being specific, yeah, you're really talking about a kind of vision. Mm. And so many times as leaders, we're talking about vision that's out there in the horizon. And what I love about you is you're talking about clarity in the in the focus. You're talking about focus here, mm. the vision and clarity. The the changes of culture that you're introducing. I heard it loud and clear these these other things: habit stacking, booking time for it, making time to accomplish the thing that you're focused on, the the habit of learning and the habit of sharing. You know, I I I teach at the universities and what I share with people is there's really only three kinds of content that work on the internet. Mm. There's educational content, there's entertainment content, and there's conversational content. Anything else is UGC, content for the people, by the people, but it doesn't move the financial needle. But in the educational content, you have to have a piece of new information and you have to have an action or a use for that information. It's not just enough to tell someone, here's the new new. Mm -hmm. If you can incorporate it in their lives or their actions, they own it. And you do that, I can tell in your practice. Um, I love hearing that. It makes me wonder why I don't encounter more leaders like you in the CX industry. I wonder how we can make more of you. <laughs> That's humbling to hear. Uh, well, if I'm doing my role right, if I'm doing what I do well, we are making multiplication. Like I'm not going to change any one of my teams or the cultures I'm in. I, I can be a part of that. I can hopefully build more multiplication if, if I can listen to the teams get them to see things that they haven't seen before. A lot of this is me asking them questions, them solving their own challenges, but there has to be a catalyst. I'm okay being that catalyst. You, we, you mentioned those behaviors I was doing. What I didn't mention was they've evolved. So I've evolved the inspirational send a few times. I've evolved how our team meets and connects a few times. I'm always looking for feedback, just like we do from our customers. What's working, what's not working? We start our weekly meetings, even our one-on-ones. How are you feeling? We throw up the feelings wheel, which is like 200 plus feelings, or a very simple numerical scale, one to five. I'm big into numbers. I do this with my kids, eight, six, and five. After a baseball game or an art exhibition, on a scale of one to five, how do you feel? And, and they're getting good. They're like, this is like a three. I'm like, well, is it a three? Like, well, you know what? It's probably more like a one. You know. It's funny you say that because I've implemented a very similar thing oh, no in way. my home. We have we have a ten scale. Okay, one to ten. And five is neutral, zero is I'm depressed, and mm. ten is I'm elated. And so at any time when mm. my wife or I or one of the people in the family is like having trouble reading the room or wants to connect with you emotionally, we just say, What number are you? That is fantastic. That's it. And numbers allow us to kind of, I love the feelings wheel. It's articulate something very specific. But numbers we can quickly compare. We can quickly analyze. Year five, year three. And generally people share the same number sets, you know? And it's really changed how we look at our moods. There's a great tool we're using now called Range. Automates this. Allows us to do check-ins automatically. We just adopted it because we were doing virtual in-person check-ins. And now we're doing asynchronous, but with some personal touches. So I have found the numbers, much like you, maybe to help us when we are getting to like a triggered or a, 
I'm noticing something about you. The other mention was about education, and there has to be something new, and that's to be something in action. To a fault, maybe, I will read a book, put it to work. Oh man, like I give myself that ability to experiment like that. Like some things will take and some things won't, but to a fault, like my team knows this. I could read an article. Oh, let's do customer impact stories. I think there's something we should really do. And then let's do them as fast as possible because we might read something else and we might want to do something different. Uh, but then there are some tried and true things that as you educate yourself, the team, and even to the customer, like the newness of an idea and your ability to apply it probably is more indicative of success than even the newness of the idea. It's the application. How quickly can you put it to use? And that's why the tools we're making at Block, the experiences we're making at Block, I'm, I'm bullish. I'm, I'm excited to get our customers to use them. You know, It's not necessarily that they're new. Some of these things have been out there. We're getting to them now. Customers already know how to use them. Can they use them for tax? Can they use them for banking? Can they use them for small business advisorship? And I think they can. I want to reiterate some of that, but I'm not, the, it was so eloquent. People, thank God, they can just scrub backwards in this podcast and listen to what you said again to get the depth of what you were just expressing. Can we switch the topic to shoelaces? Sure. All right. <laughs> you said something earlier about letting people solve their own problems. Mm -hmm. And here's a problem I see with leaders and management in a lot of places and you you really described a great recipe for not doing this yeah. <clears throat> which is I kind of see tasks as mm. tying your tying shoelaces mm -hmm. if you ask me to tie your shoelaces I will and I'm certain if I ask you to tie mine you will but if you ask if I ask you to tie your own shoelaces then there has to be a trust. There has to be a leap of, of, of allowance or permission to let you tie the shoelace the way you need to. Mm -hmm. And so many times as managers, I think that there's a second step after the shoelace is tied. That's an evaluation of it. And I'm not into that. If you tie the shoelace and you do it your way, it expresses to me that you, you have competency and you have courage and you have confidence we we there's too many people taking away confidence and 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 safety in failure and in new or different just because i tie my shoelaces differently doesn't make me wrong and and it in fact doesn't make you very right if you have a different way to do it hmm. but that's not that's that's an unpopular or maybe hard to scale corporate I would, behavior. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head. It is a hard to scale corporate behavior because most corporations are still run under Taylorism. Break it down. Taylorism. Frederick Taylorism, I believe, the inventor of managerial structure. Today, I don't know if that's where the most successful companies are fostering the best culture. Now, that doesn't mean that there still aren't direct reporting lines, there still aren't functions of a company. It's the idea that matrixed relationships are actually becoming more dominant and more influential. But it's the idea that confidence is doing it well like the next person. Our purpose at H&R Block, and I'm going to get back to shoelaces, is to provide help and inspire financial confidence for our clients and communities everywhere. When that was crafted, it was a hook for me. Inspiring confidence is different than the outcome of filing taxes for a customer or building a bank to allow them to move money. Financial confidence is your ability to better put in an effort and to know you have help to achieve what you want. So when I look at my team, we have to take that approach. Otherwise, how can we deliver that to the customer? But that doesn't mean that there is this gap where we're not helping, supporting, guiding. So in order to make somebody confident, you also have to might, you also might need to direct more, especially when you notice that designer or content designer not 
being able to do something that they've never done before. Well, of course, you should step in and help. But you have to also build their confidence. They can do it again without you. Yeah. And that evaluation step often becomes a critic critic step. We, yeah. we start to criticize as, as opposed to, I saw what you did there. I didn't think of it that way. That's an amazing outcome. Let's go test that. I thought it would be this. You came up with something very different. Let's go see what's there. It's a lot less ego. It's a lot of humility. You, you also mentioned, so I want to touch on just one second, psychological safety, which is everywhere today. That's not a new concept. We're just paying more attention to it. Teams have to feel safe together. And you also have to feel like you can experiment and embrace that fear Let me while you experiment. You. Let me unpack that with you. Because <clears throat> what you said, yes, but, mm -hmm. and psychological safety as the norm and its prevalency is certainly something we can observe. But what I like to look at is psychological safety and its number is different for everyone else. Totally. And when you get past, hey, we're all going to be safe here, you can get to who wants to be the riskier person, mm -hmm. who feels confident in more unknown, and allowing your teams to say, I'm kind of crazy, <laughs> send me in there. Or, yeah. hey, I'm good, send the crazy person. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to have a richer, inclusive understanding that while we may support this one thing, inside it is a whole new range of diversity. I'm so glad you got to diversity. Uh, and I might sound like this is how I've always thought. It is not. I went to architecture school. It's a very critical environment. Um, over time, I've learned some of this stuff. You mentioned diversity. When we hire people to the teams, about four years ago, I developed a way of looking at personality beyond the hiring process. So we use the Adobe Creative Personality. Adobe crafted it, it's scientific. Maybe it's not how everybody would want to look at themselves, but I build teams now. One data point when we think about hiring people is what creative personality they fit in. We don't want all makers on our team. There's actually eight personalities. We want a nice, well-rounded. And then I ask each manager, look at your team, stack your team accordingly. We're trying to get to a diversity of thought, a diversity of lived experiences. The other thing I'm learning, I'm reading this book called The End of Average. Great book. It challenges the idea that we are a single trait or a single personality all the time. And one of the key principles is an if-then. In some situations, Dennis is probably risk averse, but not in every situation. So if Dennis is around a group of well-known people, he is more risk tolerant. If Dennis is around people he doesn't know well, he's more risk adverse. I'm making that up. That's, yeah. We yeah. are jagged, another principle of the book. We oscillate between character traits, personality traits. It's complex. People don't like to think of themselves or think of their teams in such a complex. It's tough. It's not easy. Let's just be binary. Let's be one or the other. So true. It's so much harder. I, I give you. A, I'll take it back to more uh, business, like basics. Um, I was working at an agency. There was a campaign that came through. It was from the state. Mm. There was funds to do. Um, to there was a lot of economic development, buildings going on. They really wanted workplace safety to be more um, visible to people and for workers to be safer on these giant construction sites. That's a good thing. Yep. So they came to the agency and said, we want, we're going to invest, give you this money to do a really cool television commercial. And at the agency, we were like, I don't think you should, we should do a television commercial because Dennis on the job site, when he has his hard hat on and is working and thinking about his coworkers, that's where job safety happens. When Dennis gets home and he's eating dinner, watching TV, and trying to relax from the day, mm. he's not. TV isn't where he is thinking about workplace safety. It'd be better to really invest all that money in stickers that you could put all over the job site that says, in a funny way, "Be safe. Look out for your other workers. Wear your hard hat." But the point being, 
I think where I'm aligning to is we are all vacillating, jagged, and when we can speak to the person at their yin and their yang or their zig and their zag, we have more present relationships. And you're bringing so many things back together, presentness, uh, the right type of creative for the right situation, and then understanding where they are in that journey. When we were having dinner, you spoke a lot about mapping journeys and understanding the component of time to journey. Yeah. And your example is it's all in there, right? It's not at night. It's when they're at the job site. I heard another example of when most mattresses are sold. And this is anecdotal, so I don't know if this is as true as the person was making it sound. They're sold in the middle of the night when people are sleeping on the couch and they're so frustrated at their bed. And so some mattress companies started to dial their marketing messaging, their promotions, maybe even their ads, to those sleepless, back sore, middle of the night purchasers. And that became a part of their strategy when they looked at where the customer was. Not on the weekend, walking into a big box or on a DTC website in the middle of Sunday. They're not thinking about their poor sleep. So I heard that story, it was, it was so smart, and it now sounds like your construction safety story. You know, I think back to our conversation, which is being present and reading the room, having a number, connecting with people, and you mentioned the word triggers. I like that you said the trigger and the number because as a parent or maybe even a friend, what I try to do is recognize, I try to give people permission not to be in an archetype or a personality mm. or in a stereotype. I want, to, I want to be with you and say sometimes, yeah, Andrew's not into it at this minute. Andrew's very into it at this minute. And staying aligned with people of, and the reason I do this is owning my own business, being a parent, one thing. Owning a business where I have um, 40 employees or 40 teammates, what I've learned in this last year is every week, no matter how good someone is at their job, no matter how healthy they are or how mentally fit or no matter how much muchness of anything, mm -hmm. once a week somebody has a crisis that's outside of their control and they deal with it by themselves mm -hmm. separate from their job. And many times they don't even say it. And I hear about it because it affects something and what I always try to do when someone comes to me and says, I'm sorry, I'm like, first, no. Second of all, your life coming into this um, business is, it's, that is a new norm. Let's normalize, mm -hmm. you've got a life. And that if we all embrace that we have crises, if we all just say, next week somebody's gonna have a crisis, then whoever it is has the safety to say, uh, it's me this week, and everybody can say, all right, cool, it's not me, I got you. So I think understanding that <clears throat> everything's always changing for us and leaving some sense of compromise or grace hmm. in as a business philosophy as we approach our work, that we have to care for the humans that we work with as much as we have to get our shoelaces tied. You're such a courageous person because you have a, your own business. Something that I have thought and always been, I couldn't do it, don't want to do it. Maybe I'm working up my courage to do it, but for every business owner, I'm always like, that's amazing. You run a business, you own it, and there is a change in work-life balance happening because of what we've seen in the last two years with COVID. That doesn't mean there was perfect balance before. There will be perfect balance in the future. Our team hopefully creates permission for us to talk about our life in work because it does affect work. So we share openly about what's going on in our lives. I have to lead by example. My son graduated kindergarten. I missed two important meetings, but I prioritized that and I told people that's where I am. I didn't miss the meetings. I chose to be at my son's graduation. We make sure that when our teammates are having a tough time, they're moving. Listen, moving lasts a couple days. You're gonna be here for a couple years. Get it right. 
Enjoy. Be it's present. stressful. Just move. Just move. Work will be here when it gets back. Don't worry. That's like one of the top three things that add stress to your life is moving. It could be smaller things. Picking up your kids from school. I tell my team, make sure it's in your calendar. That way I know where, not where you are. I know what the importance of that is. So I have school pickups, school drop-offs, school activities. I'm very public with that so that people know, well, why is he choosing this over that? Because work and life aren't naturally, for, for some of us, kind of segmented. They kind of flow together. And if there are segmented, if you've achieved that, what happens in your life you're bringing to work and what happens in your work life you are bringing home and the better you are, the more whole of a person you are, the jagged. you are going to have better relationships and people are going to know how to help you. I tell the team, we're not, I'm not looking for you to tell us what's happening because we're, we just want news. The team wants to support you. Yeah. If you tell us what's going on in your life or how you think your work is doing, like if you're not jazzed by your work right now, your teammate can hit you up on the side and say, hey, listen, I know what that's like. I'm here to listen. Just just text me. It's but if a, we don't know that, we can't build those type of relationships that people stick around at companies for and great teams are built on. You know, Andrew, we could go on yeah, forever yeah. and ever. What I will say is it's been a pleasure talking to you. You're a courageous, creative <laughs> leader. You are in a lucky place in your life to be surrounded with management, an ecosystem, a brand, a business that is nurturing the, the vibe and energy that you're bringing because I think it's immaculate. Thank you for talking to me. I'm going to post this at some point. I hope people listen to it and are inspired. And I hope if you're a business or brand or someone out there who can cultivate more Andrews in the world that you bring them into business. Any last words? A uh, huge thank you. Thoughtful questions. I am fortunate. And so I'm trying to use that for good and also to build something that I love being a part of. So I have skin in the game and that's why it propels me forward. Thank you for the time and hopefully people will listen to this and all of Dennis's <laughs> in the wild. <laughs> nice plug, guy. Thank you, sir. And so our time together in the wild has come to an end. To continue your journey with Dennis, connect on LinkedIn or find out more at teamwakabayashi.com. Join us next time as we continue to explore the world of CX in the wild.